Despite their similar height, Winston Churchill and William Lyon Mackenzie King didn't always see eye to eye, and yet the two had a 50-year partnership that defined an era. Here now to tell us more about the wartime actions of these two world leaders, Terry Reardon, the author of Winston Churchill and Mackenzie King, So Similar, So Different, and we welcome you back for part two of our conversation on this remarkable time in our history. Thank you, Steve. When we last left off, we left a little cliffhanger in place. It's we 1939. Did. Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, is about to be ousted by his caucus. Winston Churchill is about to become the new Prime Minister so he can prosecute the war against the Axis. And you wanted to finish the story on how that actually transpired. As I said, it was very undemocratic. Neville Chamberlain tried to stay on. The Labour Party would not agree to join a coalition with him. They said they'll, they'll go in any other coalition under any other leader. Chamberlain goes to see King George VI. They chat and they decide on the new Prime Minister and it should be Lord Halifax, the foreign minister who is an appeaser like Chamberlain. And Halifax, who had his, what I call, his finest hour, when he said, no, I'm in the House of Lords. Now, that could have been changed, so he could have come into the Commons. But he said, one guy will be running it anyway, and that's Winston Churchill. He's the guy you've got to give him the job. So they didn't have anyone else. There was no po any other possible candidate. So reluctantly, both Chamberlain and King George VI asked Churchill to form a government. Can we conclude, undemocratic maybe, but a damn good thing it turned exactly. out that way. Yes? Exactly. Okay. Let's, as we continue to pursue our first, our first uh, part of our interview, we talked about the lead up from the time these two men first met in 1900 to 1939. World War II is now upon us. And I want to pick up the story from there. But just before we do, there were a couple of, I guess, pretty significant differences in their personal lives. Number one, uh, Churchill married a very long time to the same woman. Mackenzie King never married. That's right. Uh, let's start with that. You would think, or I guess it's possible to imagine, that that would be such a significant difference. Mm -hmm. Churchill, five kids, King, no kids. Yes. That it would have prevented them from kind of getting on in a very personal and cheery way. Yes. Did it? Uh, they weren't, in the pre-war period, they weren't the best of friends. They got on because they had to. King was prime minister for most of that period. And Churchill, every time he came over, Churchill always seemed to be sitting next to him at some dinner and telling him there was a war coming. Britain has never been in greater danger. And King would put a note in his diary saying, well, I don't think that's true, and things <laughs> like that. So that was how it went. And, but as soon as the war came, then, of course, it was a different matter. And um, even when Churchill was still first Lord of the Admiralty, in March 1940, King decides in his, in his way of doing things to make sure it's to his own advantage that the phony war is going on. There's no, except at sea, there's no military actions underway. So he thought it a good idea to have an election now. He had to have one sometime in 1940. And of course, he wins a landslide victory. Churchill sends, sends him a note saying, I'm not trying to interfere in Canadian politics, but well done, we can keep, keep together in our common cause. So at least they're getting a little warmer to each other. How about on the issue of religion? Did they see that the same way? King was what he thought of as a, he had the Presbyterian religion, but what he thought it was a direct communication between God and him. Because this is important with King, that all through his life, from his early years, God and he were walking hand in hand. And he always wanted to, to be worthy of this. Mm -hmm. So when he became the leader of the Liberal Party in 1919, he, this is God's work, he was convinced that he was chosen by God to do this job. So everything he did, he went through, especially deciding on a, a mate and nothing would, was good enough for God or his mother. <laughs> and he was engaged once, which I go into, and he was 22 years of age, and his mother put a stop to that. So they personally were not compatible, he and Churchill, in many ways. But when the war comes, there's only one issue, and that's the war. Well, here's the line from your book that I thought was actually quite astonishing. Here's the quote. In 1940 to 41, Britain would not have survived as an Sorry. independent nation had it not been for the agricultural, industrial, and financial aid received from 
Canada. You agree? That was a quotation from Richard Holmes, a, a renowned British historian. And Andrew Roberts, another one, would have said the same thing. The amount of, of, of assistance, we talk about Canada gave and lent Britain $3.5 billion during the war. $3.5 billion 75 and years that ago. that was incredible. Imagine what that would be and today. And they gave actually gifts of twice $1 billion each. And this was astonishing. No one, none of us can, uh, can actually look at a million, what is a million dollars? A billion dollars, it doesn't mean anything to us. But Mackenzie King was speaking in New York and to a group there, the Pilgrim Society. He says, Canada is supplying annually 200 pounds of food for every man, woman, and child in Britain. Hmm. This was prior to the US coming in the war. What would they have been eating if they hadn't have had that uh, assistance, that from one point of view? And um, I don't want to go to, I didn't go to the extending that they would have, that Britain could not have survived, because if they hadn't made peace with Germany, and Roosevelt, of course, in 1940, was very concerned that after France had the armistice with Germany in uh, July 1940, that Britain was going to follow. And so he, I don't want to get off track here, but then he was doing everything to try and get Churchill to agree that if Britain is going to give in, they will send the fleet to neutral ports, including Canada. Hmm. How much of, you know, you, one always wonders how much of history is biography. And I, I wonder how much of that enormous commitment that Canada made to Great Britain at the time happens, not just because they're the motherland and we're the colony, yes. but because Churchill and King are really quite friendly and get along quite well at this point. King was great at following. He would only follow I would like to say that it was King who did all this, but he didn't. The, Canada joined in the Second World War in September 1939 because an overwhelming majority of the population was in favor of that. Mm -hmm. King would not have done that if he hadn't. What King did, though, was to uh, improve relations with Britain. One of them was in... May 1939, and this was King's idea, he certainly wasn't thinking about a war at the time, he invited uh, King George VI and Queen Elizabeth come over. Tremendously successful. And that was another timing of that, was another thing which helped the people here, who, was, who basically were accepting Quebec were strong Anglophiles. Hmm. Neither Churchill nor King were big fans of communism. Nope. They both gave their odd speech in the day of railing against it. So how did they justify, once the war began, aligning themselves with Mother Russia? In, uh, in 1941, was Churchill was the one who, who said, uh, even if, uh, if Satan, or something like to say, even if Satan was against Germany, I would make some nice references to him in the House of <laughs> Commons. Mm -hmm. He changed his opinion. Churchill uh, he always saw the bigger picture. And he knew that the danger was Hitler and Germany in 1941. So he didn't even, it wasn't even something he had to think much about. One of the great questions of history is, how is it that the Americans were caught napping so badly on December 7th, 1941 at yeah. Pearl Harbor? And I wonder whether Churchill and King ever had a conversation looking into that question. Yeah. I mentioned that in the Roosevelt talk into his cabinet and his secretary for the Navy, how could, we, how could we be caught with all those ships in the harbor? And the Secretary of Navy, Navy says, that's how we birthed them. It's incredible, I agree. It's a, that's a whole new book. With a lot, there's been a lot of books written on that. And Churchill and King never, never figured it out, eh? Well, no, I don't think anyone could. It was hmm. an American problem. Churchill addressed the Canadian House of Commons three weeks after Pearl Harbor. And that has gone down in history as a speech of some significance. you want that's to tell right. us why? To start with, he'd had a heart attack just two days before. He'd spoken in the, to Congress in the US, came over here on the 29th of December 1941, and he, uh, tremendous reception, and of course King makes sure that he's in the car with Churchill to 
some of this to rub off on him, of course, mm -hmm. as well. And uh, he made this speech, which has been, uh, I suppose, uh, referred to as the some chicken, some neck speech. <laughs> that was when the French generals had told their divided cabinet in May 1940 that uh, England will have a neck run by, by uh, have a neck wrung like a chicken. And then Churchill makes the statement to the House of Commons, some chicken. And then with the laughter died down, some neck. And it was a, uh, Churchill also said at the time when he was writing his Second World War memoirs, he'd had to make this major speech to Congress. And then he realized he had to do this one to the Canadian Parliament. And he said, that, he said, I don't know how I got, got it through, th through it all. Because he wrote his, all his own speeches, mm -hmm. as did King. And it was. It's uh, remarkable how he could, um, he could do the, the speeches he did. One, just going uh, back a little bit, was in uh, November 1940 when Neville Chamberlain died. He was the person who basically kept Churchill out of the cabinet all through the 30s. He was the strong man in the government, even when Baldwin was prime minister. And Churchill did the most amazing speech about his conscience. He did what was right for his conscience. And he meant it, too, didn't and he? And he meant it. Yep. Well, there was a thing, he, as he said afterwards, because he read it beforehand to his wife, Clementine. And, and Clementine said, oh, that is wonderful, beautiful. And it was Churchill's secretary who records this later on. And Churchill says, well, I could have written it the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> but of course. <laughs> No, he did mean it. He actually became quite fond of, Ch of Chamberlain in the mm -hmm. end, because Chamberlain actually encouraged Churchill in the, uh, when he became prime minister, because he was in very soft ground then, mm. and uh, Chamberlain supported him through some of the problems. I want to bring you back to 1941, just at yes. that speech at the Canadian House of Commons, the uh, some chicken, yes. some neck speech. The most famous picture ever taken yes. of the millions that no doubt were taken of Winston Churchill was taken then. That's right. Tell us the story of how that came together. Karsh was... Joseph Karsh. Joseph Karsh was a friend of Mackenzie King. Mackenzie King had supported him, and uh, so he, he said to him in earlier, earlier in December, this was af obviously after Pearl Harbor, um, someone is coming over here, and I want you to take photographs of it. It will be on this date, December the 30th. And he said, I can't tell you who it is, but it's someone important. So anyway, of course, uh, later on, King realized who it was. Uh, Karsh re realized who it was. So Karsh recounts that he set up his camera in the studio. It was in the speaker's chamber. And he heard, after the Churchill speech, he hears footsteps coming down the corridor. And he gets everything set up. He's very, quite nervous, Karsh was. And King and Churchill come in. And, and Churchill said, what's, what's going on here? What's, what's this? He said, no one told me about all this. And Karsh says, oh, I hope I'd be privileged to take a photograph of you, Mr. Prime Minister, on this important occasion. So Churchill says, you can take one. So Churchill sits in the chair, has a cigar out of his mouth, says, OK, take it. Karsh, he says, and he doesn't know where he got the courage to do this, he says, excuse me, sir, takes the cigar out of Churchill's mouth, and then Churchill has this roaring lion pose, which we all know now. He takes the photograph. Churchill simmers down and says, OK, you can take another one. And it was no, also only thought that there were three photographs. There was another one of he and King. When my wife and I were in the Library and Archives Canada in 2011 looking for photographs for the book, we found negatives there. We were helped by the Library and Archives Canada people. And we found negatives, which I'm fairly convinced had never been, never been shown before. And they're in your book? And they're in the book. And, um, and they're jovial. I mean, the two, King and Churchill, in, yes. in those pictures, yes. unlike the scowl, yes. they look like they're getting on quite well. Yeah. And one of them is interesting, the jovial one of the two of them. Saturday Night Magazine published that in early, in early January. To, uh, that would be 1942. King sees this picture, and he's really upset because it shows King smiling. Hmm. The Canadian Prime Minister is not supposed to smile during the war. And so 
anyway, that was, that was probably the, one of the few, actually, at that era, you saw him smiling. He did smile later on in Quebec City, but that's separate. So they're getting along quite famously, but yes. then about halfway through the war, King and Churchill got irritated with each other. What happened? Well, there's more than one. The one I said of the whole chapter in the book, I said Churchill upset with Canada twice. Uh, the first one was regarding, this was early 1942. Churchill had this idea that he wanted to um, invade northern Norway. There was a, a good reason for this. The merchant ships going to supply Russia were going through past northern Norway. Germany had a big air force base there and, and also a fairly big naval base. And all of the merchant ships going to support Russia were in threat, threatened. So Churchill decided, I think we'll invade there and what we'll do is wrap the map of Europe down from the north. His, so he passed this forward to his chiefs of staff and they had their people look at it, and they all said it's completely impractical. To try and take it is one thing, to stay there is impossible. Churchill, he never overruled his chiefs of staff in the war, but he was, this he nearly got close to. So he said to Alan Brooke and his chiefs of staff, you people don't uh, really understand what's going on here. General McNaughton, I know, has a wider view than you, so I'll chat with him about it. So McNaughton goes to uh, Chequers, the Prime Minister's residence, and Churchill gives him the royal treatment. He has a great lunch, he has parts, members of his family there, and then he goes into what we, he'd like the Canadian forces to do. Because up to this time, the Canadian forces in Britain had not been in, at war. This was prior to Dieppe. And so, McNaughton, who quite clearly knows he's being subjected to, say, as I said, the royal treatment. He said, well, I'll have, I'll have our staff look at this. So he takes all the stuff away. His staff look at it, and they say, no, it's not, it's not practical. Hmm. Churchill, again, has him over and says, you're missing the point here. <laughs> so he tries it again. And uh, so he doesn't get anywhere. And so, so that's... Uh, so then he says, well, okay, so you're not going to do this. That's disappointing. I think it would be a good idea, though, if um, McNaughton had actually said, you know, I think maybe it would be good to have better relations with, with Stalin. So I think maybe um, you could do something from that. And Church said, oh, well, that's a great idea. You'll go and see Stalin, and, uh, and then you two will get on together, and you'll work out a plan which maybe similar to what I'm suggesting now. So, so anyway, and, and uh, McNaughton said, well, I, th I should really check with the, my government first, of course. <laughs> and he said, well, no, that's fine. So it goes across, and King gets this, and King hates this at disappoint Churchill. So he's now got this other situation. They've already turned him down on the invasion of Nor Norway. Now he has to say, I'm not going to send McNaughton there. So he has to say this, he has to apologize. I, I know it's important to you, but we really don't think this is a great idea. And, he, and he agon uh, King agonizes over this, but then he says this. And mm. Churchill is completely baffled by Canada, won't buy into his schemes. But speaking, speaking of baffling, the first elections after World War II is over, as you look back at it now, seem baffling. Churchill loses. He That's saves right. the West. He saves Western civilization and then goes yeah. back to the polls and loses. And William Lyon Mackenzie King only wins a minority government in his first attempt after the war. Uh, with the benefit of all of this hindsight, how did that happen? Both King winning, Churchill losing were based on one thing. The future, the people in the war, the Canadians and the Brits, they wanted someone to assure them that they, it was go life was going to be better for them after the war. In Canada, King was, he had, he brought in the baby bonus. He had all these nice little goodies going. The conservative opposition were still on. You should have brought conscription in earlier. 
<laughs> and they, this was their tag, and that's not what people wanted to do. Even though King was looked on as not being supportive of the armed forces because he didn't want, didn't want to bring in conscription, <coughs> he, um, he won the, the vote from the forces. He got more votes than the Conservatives or the CCF, which later became the NDP. Now, in Britain, Churchill was still be on a negative platform. And he said a statement which was ridiculously stupid. I shouldn't say this about the guy in my book. But it was, he actually compared the Labour Party. And if you were like the Labour Party, you're bringing in a form of Gestapo. His wife had seen the speech beforehand. She says, you can't say that. These were Attlee, Bevin. These were the ones who supported you all through the war. Mm. Churchill was determined. And that, not just that speech, but all his was on a negative platform. That's not what the people wanted to know. Labour Party promoted this vision of a utopia. And that was it. He lost. And he should have lost. He should have lost, you think? He, he, des he deserved to lose that election. On that basis, yeah. Hmm. Now, and I should mm -hmm. say that, um, as comes out, Churchill was a fabulous war leader. In peace, except for, for standing up to the Russians, which, of course, he did. And he brought in so many aspects on domestic policy, though in Britain, uh, he, that he wasn't too interested in that. He was interested in the international sphere, mm -hmm. and he would have been really good at standing up to Stalin, as he did with his Fulton, Missouri speech in early 1946. The Iron Curtain speech. The Iron Curtain speech. Mm -hmm. But as far as domestic policy, uh, not so much. Not so good. Uh, we've got a few minutes left, and I want to touch on two more things. Number one, their last meeting. When was it? What happened? 1948. Uh, King had basically resigned, but he had to go over there. Sonoran said, will you go over to, even though I'm the new leader, will you go over to, uh, to the, the peace conference and uh, represent me there because I'm, I want to get across the country and build up support and get to know this country. And uh, King had had heart problems. And when he came back from France, he was uh, checked over by Lord Moran, who was Churchill's doctor. And he said, I think you've got some problems. I'll get the specialist. So he got a specialist from Harley Street. And he, they decided he should not be part of the, the Commonwealth Conference. He should be confined to bed, his bed at the Dorchester Hotel. And he, during the time there, he was visited by many people, including Churchill. And I go into um, the circumstances, and they, they chatted. And King, realizing this is probably the last time we'll meet. And they were both very emotional people. Churchill King, kissed him. And King asked, he said, as they were leaving, he said, will you do one thing for me, Winston? And he kissed his cheek. Hmm. And that was a very moving uh, point. And it shows, it shows the, uh, how close they'd become by this time, too. One last thing. Mackenzie King retires as prime minister in 49. Churchill gets a last hurrah. He comes back as PM in 51 for one more term. King is dead in 1950. Churchill dies on the same day as his father in yes. 65. Which he predicted. Mm -hmm. Churchill is in Westminster Abbey. King is in a cemetery five minutes from with this studio. That's right. You've been there. I've been to the cemetery. I have not been to his grave. Interesting. I should be. <laughs> you are five minutes away from William Lyon, the Kenzie right. King's grave. And I've not been there. There's I've been no to time. Churchill's grave in Bladen. Yeah. Well, you're Egypt. not five minutes away from Churchill right exactly. now. Exactly. Do you, um, so that's interesting. You have not it felt a, a, a need to, to be there. I've been too busy promoting the book. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second. You live in Toronto. I do. And you haven't seen Mackenzie King's grave. I, know. I, I mean to, Steve. I, I will. I, I am in my Sunday school matronly worst here, admonishing yeah. you for not having done and that. I, and I deserve to be admonished. <laughs> You know what? Maybe right after this program is over, you and I should take a quick spin <laughs> over there and, and check. But mind you, yeah. I've been there already. Sure. Uh, I want to tell you how great it is uh, to have had you here in the studio to go over this time in history, which is obviously so important to your original country and your new country. Uh, the name of the book by Terry Rudin is Winston Churchill and Mackenzie King, so similar, so different, with a foreword by John Napier Turner. 
which is also a good read as well. Terry, thanks so much for coming into TVO tonight. We've enjoyed Thank you having for inviting you. me. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.